Hi, everybody. Welcome to the CrocCast podcast. I'm your host, Nate, along with my co-host, Matt. Hey. And today we're going to give a brief intro of our show and then have our first interview with Dr. Chris Carmichael. So a little bit about me, uh, I kind of got into reptiles and herpetology like a lot of people in my generation by watching The Crocodile Hunter and all those different documentaries growing up. And uh, now I've been so many years since that that uh, it's kind of morphed into keeping reptiles, so I do have a small collection of my own. But I've also done a few internships here and there, and that's about all the essentials you need to know about me. Yeah, so uh, I got into herpetology. Um, well, as a kid, I was always I always watched like Crocodile Hunter and different documentaries and stuff, and I always loved animals and, and science um, and biology. That always interested me. And um, it wasn't until about middle school that I I, uh, I met a friend who was at, who was big into reptiles as well, and that's what led me to kind of exclude all other animals and really <laughs> go with uh, reptiles as it. Um, that kind of like friendship really like stirred my passion for it and everything. So um, I also have a particular interest in research as well. So um, uh, that's that's my main focus is like research oriented herpetology, and that's how, kind of how I got started. It's just a passion of pet since I was a little kid, and um, it's just grown to something bigger now. <laughs> so always going out catching and herp uh, catching reptiles and stuff, and keeping them for a few weeks was always fun. So. Yeah. What about uh, you, Dr. Carmichael? Well, uh, my twin brother Rob and I, we, we uh, like you guys, you know, we, we, we uh, you know, grew up loving animals, and I think every kid at some point wants a pet that they can hold and those kind of things. So uh, my parents got us the traditional hamster, gerbil, those kind of things, but quickly we started expressing some uh, extreme allergies to the, uh, to the rodent group. So uh, we ended up... Um, uh, our allergist kind of recommended doing some fish, so we got some fish. Uh, fish were cool for about a day, and then uh, uh, we then kind of uh, went to some aquatic turtles that ate the fish, and I thought that was a lot more cool. So uh, from there, the turtles went to tortoises, and tortoises went to lizards, and lizards went to snakes eventually. Um, you know, it's, it's one of those things I think our allergists had told our parents that this would just be a fleeting little short-term interest and you know we'd move on but uh, that never happened and uh, I think by the time we were in, in middle school my brother and I our, our, our bedroom was literally lined with you know just dozens and dozens of different types of reptiles um, our dad would take us to the zoo uh, and, and mom would, they would take us to the zoo almost every you know quite quite often and typically it, it usually meant dropping us off at the reptile house and picking us up later on there so we we you know, we just kind of gravitated to the uh, to the to the scaly brethren and you know from there it uh, just stuck and uh, loved it, loved it all the way through and uh, was fortunate to later on the very curator uh, Ray Pauly at Brookfield Zoo that you know, he was like the the rock star to me uh, but uh, later on in life I was able to work with him um, after grad school uh, as a zookeeper in the reptile house for a little bit and loved it and that just kind of kept on. Uh, fueling my interest in uh, herpetology. Later on, I went into uh, looking at more of the research side of things, and uh, was fortunate uh, fortunate to be able to work with uh, the Tuatara in New Zealand as part of my master's degree, and then uh, part of my PhD degree was mainly looking at some uh, different Indonesian pythons. So that's that's the uh, I guess the short version of, of how I got into it. So. Yeah, I actually, um, that's funny. I think the, the pet route actually played a little role in, in me as well because my parent, my family was always into cats, and I hate cats. And uh, yeah. <laughs> cats are kind of more of a, seen as more of like a feminine pet anyway, so I was like, I want my own pet. And I guess, you know, the antithesis to that would then be reptiles. <laughs> and so, but my mom hated reptiles, so I would just go out and catch them and then keep them in tanks <laughs> out in the in, in my garage or in my room and stuff and she'd find out a few weeks later so I'd let him go and then I'd go catch another one and <laughs> that helped feed my love for reptiles too <laughs> yeah my mom also had a really uh, strict no reptile rule in the house until uh, finally I got my first snake probably about 
three years ago now, and I just had uh, snake fever, so reptile fever ever since. Just been adding more and more stuff. Yeah, so uh, you mentioned that you did uh, master's work with the Tuatara and the PhD work. Um, what are you currently working on right now? Uh, I'm focusing um, on uh, some different research, mainly with uh, actually venoms and, uh, and Gila monsters. And so that's something that we've been looking at um, over the last few years uh, in conjunction with Dr. Steve Feigard in our Institute for Cancer Research at Bob Jones University. So uh, a lot of that, still doing some uh, some snake work as well, uh, but right now the, the, the big part of it is uh, kind of uh, getting a better handle on, 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 on exactly you know the, the properties of the venom in both Gila monsters and Mexican beetle lizards, um, and just adding to the data you know the data set that's out there, um, you know trying trying to find you know it, it's a it's a tricky thing trying to find out what what in venom is targeting what on the cells and how are they, you know, how is it causing a change in behavior of the cell and physiological machinery inside the cell, what's it doing to that. So uh, a lot, lot of work to be done with that. But that's kind of where we kind of shifted. Uh, I, lo- I love Gila monsters and beetle lizards on top of it. They're just a phenomenal reptile to work with. Um, so I think it's the, uh, the best of both worlds <laughs> with that. So we get the, you know, we basically extract the venom and, uh, and then um, uh, we, we test the venom and try to purify some of the proteins and peptides from the venom to see how that is targeting certain types of, at this, at this point, certain types of uh, small cell carcinomas and then lung, uh, lung uh, cancer tissue. Um, so what, and this is kind of more of a, a little bit more of a contentious or a point for debate, I guess, um, in the, the reptile hobby and whatnot. But um, there's uh, there's the prevalent thought that like Mexican beaded lizards and Gila monsters are the only venomous lizards out there. Uh, but there's right. a lot of other people that are um, adamant that there are more. I know Brian Fry believes there are more. What are, what are your thoughts oh, on yeah. the, the topic? Oh, there, 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 without a doubt, there's uh, um, you know we've we've, we've got um, we've, we've got other venomous lizards. You know Brian Fry, Dr. Fry has certainly shown that pretty much uh, without without really any doubt. Uh, there's uh, there's a group of, you know, the, the, the taxonomy of lizards right now is kind of a, a, a little, kind of going through a change right now because of the fact we have some venomous species, uh, including the Komodo dragon uh, now, and there's no doubt that Komodo dragon uh, is, is a venomous lizard. I mean, they have uh, they have spongy tissue in the uh, uh, mandibular gland, uh, the salivary, the modified salivary glands that are uh, producing uh, toxins, and you know, it's been so much. It's, it's, it's been it's been very you know, uh, a lot of herpetologists that know Komodo dragons well. You know, the old story is that they bite the prey, the prey go off, die from a bacterial infection, and bacterial infections uh, you know can be pretty wicked, but they don't work that fast. And there's no doubt that uh, you know a lot of the signatures of of the of the prey death seem to be more in line with a some sort of uh, toxin. So. Uh, that, that, I think, is really kind of launched into um, a bunch of work by Dr. Fry to really kind of nail down you know, the, the, the type of toxins that are in the uh, saliva. Is this a venom? Um, and at this point, it appears that uh, there's been some isolated messenger RNA transcripts um, in, in that venom, you know, at least in that saliva of Komodo dragons, uh, that seem to encode various types of bioactive peptides and proteins that that, that target a whole bunch of different things from, you know, an, anti-platelet function to other types of things that, uh, that you know, cause the uh, quick demise of the prey that they just bit, so. Would you say it's more of like a um, taxonomic issue right now more than just like, because uh, you don't really see like a lot of like official news out there of like, Okay, this this is we're gonna cl- we're classifying these as venomous, you know, and, and so on and so forth. Would you say it's yeah. just a taxonomic? Well, right? yeah. So right now, the I think that one of the ideas is that uh, um, is that we we kind of take the uh, the venomous lizards. Let's say, for example, uh, beetle lizards, Gila monsters, maybe uh, Komodo dragons. Probably there's probably other monster lizards that uh, that no doubt also produce a venom. Uh, but you know, basically put them. Within more, instead of a, at this point, instead of a taxonomic group per se, you know, let's say, you know, you have to order squamata, for example, instead of having a separate order or a separate suborder, um, is 
because right now they've been sort of grouped into what's called a clade uh, called inguimorpha, and there's one toxic, uh, toxifera uh, basically within that uh, the clade that, that is kind of encompassing some of these venomous lizards. Uh, so it's, it's not, it's not, it's, it's, there's, there's not a taxonomic resolution at this point, although I think Dr. Fry will try to be, if anybody pulls it off as far as trying to put this picture together, you know, Dr. Fry will definitely, uh, will definitely do that. She's not already done that. And I think as additional publications come out, I think it'll, uh, it'll be more resolved. But, uh, you know, at this point, that's kind of, uh, at last I knew, that's kind of where things are at. But, you know, taxonomy, tell you what, taxonomy is probably the hardest thing to stay current on because it changes daily. So, but, uh, that's kind of where things are at. Yeah, and uh, besides Helidromatids and Varanids, I've heard a few rumors that maybe some Iguanids have some sort of uh, yep. peptides yep. and Iguanids. stuff like that in their saliva. What's, yep. what's your knowledge uh, on that? Yeah, I mean, there's, the bottom line is that there's, it, 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 it's, it's likely that uh, most, let's say many lizards contain toxins, okay? And these toxins, you know, the, the, the interesting thing is that when you start looking at, you know, what, what, you know, what, what's the composition of these, of, 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 of salivary secretions, you know, sort of thing. And so if you start looking at, you know, venom per se, you know, venom is just a, a form of a toxin, you know, really produced by an animal for the purpose of typically causing harm to another and that is injected. Now, it could be for the purpose of subduing prey. But for a lot of lizards, even like the, say, for example, um, you know, the Gila monster. The Gila monsters eat typically baby animals and eggs and things that they're not using the venom per se for necessarily killing the, the organism that they're consuming. You know, even even small baby rabbits that they do take uh, out of burrows, you know, are, are not going to, you know, inflict any kind of major harm and they can be killed pretty quickly by, by hemorrhaging some other things. But uh, the bottom line is that um, there's a lot of unknowns as to what is the exact function of venom in a lot of lizards. It could just be for defense mechanism. It could be maybe as a precursor for di for chemical digestion, um, and that there's a secondary benefit of maybe predator deterrence, you know, sort of thing. So, uh, but you know, you know, if you, if you kind of look at venom as a form of a that is a form of toxin produced by the animal, that sort of begs the question: then what you know, what exactly is a toxin? Well, you know, if, if iguanas are believed to have a venom, a toxin per se, you know, the, you know that, that a toxin really is any, it, it can be almost any kind of protein or even, even a small protein like a peptide uh, that, um, you know, by, by some, some sort of chemical reaction uh, causes some sort of molecular change in the cells of the bite. So um, it doesn't necessarily have to be, ven you know, again, we have medically important venoms, we have those that are not. Those that are medically important are those that cause issues to humans sort of thing. So, you know, there's no doubt iguanas, you know, there's iguanas that seem to be uh, at least showing some properties in their saliva that have that have at least a venomous quality. I don't think any, but I think most herpetologists would be a little uh, reluctant to <laughs> call out a green iguana as being a venomous lizard sort of thing. But, you know, there's no doubt there's proteins and peptides and you know, other types of molecules, even like glycoproteins and uh, other types of uh, molecules that uh, are also found in you know, and venoms by, you know, what we would consider to be you know, truly venomous species. So how would you say that, um, like, combining that with, like, the taxonomic question, like, so, like, with garter snakes, um, I've heard that they're venomous, but not at all in any way that affects humans. It mainly right. affects the prey they catch. Um how, how does well, that, like, go into, yeah, like, well, the portion of it? The taxonomic portion? Again, you know, I think, I think if you start with the uh, premise that perhaps, you know, toxins are a lot more prevalent than what we thought it was, it may not really change, it may not really change the taxonomy, per se. I mean, if you've got a snake in the family, for example, Colubridae, you know, we have venomous, non, and what we call non-venomous species, like the garter snake, which we now know also has peptides that, are, are at least are, at least have some level of a uh, that could be considered to be a toxin. It may not be medically important to you and I. May not cause any kind of a, a reaction to you and I, uh, but does ta target uh, specific receptors on the cells of prey that has some sort of function. Again, it could be it just helps in the uh, uh, it help, may help in, in cellular breakdown for the purpose of chemical, chemical digestion. It could be something else. Uh, but I don't, I don't know at this point if, you know, if we start finding that, that these toxins are really prevalent amongst many, many species, uh, these peptides, these proteins, we find these toxins or make these toxins, I, I don't know if it's really going to necessarily change the, the, you know, the, the nature of taxonomy as we see it today. I think it's going to be mainly based on, you know, usually first and foremost, genetic similarities and differences, or it can be the, the 
Venom becomes a big player and, a, and catches on pretty uh, by, by, you know, by, uh, by Firestorm, by very important publications, maybe it becomes a another one of the character states we can use to resolve taxonomy. You know, typically we have, you know, at least we, the, the three primary character states we use to resolve taxonomy is mainly, you know, first and foremost, uh, the molecular genetic uh, you know, component uh, or, you know, genetic similarities and, and differences, uh, behavioral uh, differences and, and similarities, and then also certainly uh, just, uh, uh, you know, just your, you know, your, your, your uh, physical characteristics as well. So, you know, whether or not we had a fourth one, the venom, you know, venom, peptide, similarities, who knows, maybe that'll catch on. So. Yeah, I guess it, cause I, right now my job is, uh, I work as a research biologist studying mosquitoes, and like, yeah. I guess a good analogy with that would be like, there are some mosquitoes that can transmit diseases, whereas there are others that don't for various reasons, either they don't, you know, um, get blood meals from humans or whatever, so, but taxonomically, they're still, they're, like, it doesn't um, have a huge effect taxonomically on them, but it can play a role. Um, so I guess it'd be that'd be a good analogy for that. Yeah, and again, it might be that maybe maybe that we don't get to the point where we have a separate taxonomic uh, grouping of venomous, you know, reptiles within a certain you know family, subfamily, and it may be just more of a, uh, more 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 just looking at clade analysis that we're going to call this group uh, a, a clade, which doesn't have a taxonomic term, but still has taxonomic significance as far as the origin of some of these character states that we see, such as uh, such as venom. Cool. Um, do you want to uh, talk about um, your uh, specific research with the tuatars in New Zealand? And cause that, that's actually pretty cool. I'd like to hear about some of that if you want. If you could do. Yeah. So um, uh, what we are looking at it was, it was a very uh, kind of multi path sort of. Uh, um, research. I was working with Dr. Jim Gillingham. Uh, he's a emeritus professor at Central Michigan University. And I was uh, fortunate to come in under his uh, National Geographic grant. And uh, so, uh, anyways, uh, my my main role was to look at the feeding ecology uh, of the tuatara. Um, initially, it was going to be looking at the uh, the, 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 the variation in, in feeding the, the, the variation in the feeding ecology between two different. Uh, uh, Two, two quite different types of habitat we, we found on Stevens Island. Um, one is a grassy area, one's a forested area. We find, we find two tar in both, uh, but we find, found that the two tar in the forested areas were just more robust, seemed to be more healthy, just chunkier as compared to the two tar in the uh, open paddock area. So, you know, the obvious question is, well, what's going on? Why is that the case? Uh, so we wanted to kind of look at that, which we did, and pretty well nailed it down. It had a lot to do with the quality of the prey, uh, in the uh, forest areas, this was much had a much larger calorie content, um, and then the size of t territories of the tuatara uh, in the forest areas were just much smaller. So they're they're having to you know they have to you know patrol less area to get better prey versus what was going on in the paddock area. So that was one thing we were looking at. We were also looking at uh, uh, the feeding ecology of the tuatara on different islands as well, and that one had that, that you know that had some significance in that uh, some of the islands we looked at. Um, actually uh, ended up um, having uh, some different, uh, you know, eventually we kind of broke the tuatara into uh, several different species based on some genetic uh, variation. So anyways, the long and short of it is that my, my specific part was just kind of looking at what they were feeding on. Um, so, you know, really a, lot, a big part of my study was kind of looking at, you know, doing lot, you know taking lots of stomach uh, samples uh, through a very somewhat non-invasive <laughs> procedure of of, it, of uh, you know, basically uh, running some water into their stomach and then uh, uh, forcing the contents out through really just a, uh, a vomit reflex. Um, and then we would uh, keep the two tar up for a couple of days in an outdoor pen just to make sure they were, they were okay. And then we would, uh, you know, release them to the site where, uh, where we capture them. Um, and then we would uh, do a lot of uh, prey capture. Uh, so we did lots of different methods to uh, capture potential prey. Uh, and uh, and then uh, uh, we would uh, you know just kind of look at kind of correlate uh, whether or not there was uh, feeding uh, preferences, uh, avoidance behaviors to certain prey, where it might be based on prey abundance. So that's a lot, a lot of what we did with that. We also looked at uh, reproductive behaviors, looking at trying to decipher the courtship behaviors. A lot of that was done through 
uh, to the work of Dr. Jim Gillingham, and then uh, we had some uh, uh, contributions to that as well. Um, so it was, just, it was a great project. I mean, I couldn't, I mean it was, uh, the tuatara was one of those species that I grew up drawing pictures of. My mom said she even showed me some pictures of what I used to draw. And so I was quite, quite enamored by the tuatara to be able to work with them in the field, to be able to hold the tuatara. Uh, was truly uh, life changing, especially knowing that some of these tutara, you know, were easily 80, 100 plus years old and uh, just a remarkable species. Was there any uh, unusual prey items you found that tuatara is preyed on? Um, well, you know, they're, they're definitely pretty opportunistic. So anything they can overpower uh, and catch, they're, it's, it's, it's fair game. Could be other, actually, smaller tutara. Uh, they, uh, during certain parts of the year, they, they took a lot of, of seabird heads. <laughs> they didn't eat the whole seabird because they're just too big, but uh, uh, you, know, you, you used to see in the old, uh, old, old, old books of tuatars that tuatars and seabirds had this sort of uh, kumbaya sort of loving kind of relationship that they would you know, share the same burrows. And, you know, that, was, that was so far from the truth that uh, actually... Uh, seabirds would opportunistically try to use the tuatara burrows uh, uh, for laying their eggs, but uh, if they happen to uh, head first venture into a, a burrow that has a tuatara, uh, quite often the tuatara would grab the head, and they have a very interesting jaw mechanism with, and some very interesting modified uh, incisors that they would use to decapitate uh, the seabirds. They would eat the head, and they would leave the carcass, uh, and so you'd find a lot of headless birds, uh, especially these little birds called fairy prime, uh, during their nesting season, you'd find just a whole bunch of these headless carcasses all over the place. So that was kind of interesting. Um, but I think the, the, the other thing that was interesting was on Stevens Island, which is probably the largest known population of tuatara, is that the tuatara in the open paddock grass area primarily were eating up these little, kind of what we call in North America, these little roly polies, you know, what you find underneath the logs, these little tiny little isopods that would, you know, curl up like an armadillo, but they were the small little isopods, and uh, they, they would eat these by the hundreds, and uh, that was a lot of, a lot of the prey they consumed were, were, were these little isopods they'd find both in the burrows that they used as well as on the rocks that were prevalent on the, uh, in the open paddock area. So they, they had to eat a lot of these to try to keep up with some calories, and there's no doubt that had a lot to do with the uh, kind of the lack of robustness they had in these uh, paddock areas. I had read that, um, and you can correct this if it's wrong. I had read that tuataras um, can only survive within like a between like seventy and seventy-five degrees, um, like that. That's yeah. their just homeostatic temperature range. Is that a result of being pushed onto like the islands of New Zealand, or 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 on like or back when they were actually on the mainland of New Zealand, or um, or is that like a? I mean, I mean, there's no doubt. There? Well. Here's the thing, they're, they're actually, you can actually find them active uh, in, in, in the low 50s. I mean, we, we, were on one, we were on a couple islands when it was uh, in the 50s, and they were still lumbering around like it was nothing. So I think that range is a little bit, a little narrow than what you actually see in the field. Um, they, they're, they're, I would say the majority of the time that they're active would, would be kind of in that, uh, you know, low 70s, maybe upper 60s, low 70s. You know, you'll find them pretty active in that range. They're not real... They're not real hip about uh, anything higher than that. I mean, certainly you'll get sun spots that develop that will definitely heat up uh, much warmer than that. Uh, but they they really uh, they, they they really seem to kind of prefer the uh, the cooler environment. And therefore, they do spend a lot of time uh, underneath in burrows. Uh, but they will come out. You know, during a, during the daytime in the forested area, you'll find them out and about all over the place. Up in you know uh, up in low growing shrubs, you'll find them on the on the forest floor. Um, in the paddock area, you don't find them out and about very often during the daytime. A lot of that has to do with a, uh, a predator called the uh, Australasian Harrier. Uh, it's a hawk-like animal, and uh, uh, these hawks will patrol these islands for, uh, for prey, including tuatara. And so the tuatara, without that protective cover of the canopy in the, in the, in the uh, paddock area, these grass areas, they, they don't come out and about very often during the daytime. Nighttime, they do, but... Uh, um, but uh, uh, but anyways, so the, you know, activity differences were quite different. But you know, really, temperature goes as far as temperature goes. You'll find them active at much lower temperatures than that. Uh, it was not uncommon on a very cold day when we had, you know, jackets on and you know, ski hats and gloves, and you know, they seem to be 
terms of the consent being out there uh, doing their thing. They're, they're definitely uh, cold tolerant, uh, and their metabolism is extremely uh, extremely uh, low. Uh, they, they, their digestive, you know, the rate of digestion is really, it's, it takes them a long time to digest something, and so uh, they are very, very cold tolerant, um, and they, they do perfectly fine with that. Uh, an, another thing, um, I, so I thought I heard you say that they that you had or or that they were teased out into a couple different species. Um, I know I read that like at one point they were they were split into two different species and then put them back into one. Or um, so I was just curious uh, just to kind of go into more. Yeah, of that. That you, so you're, you're getting to the uh, the never changing world of systematic <laughs> taxonomy, and it's just uh, uh, you know I, I kind of leave it to those guys uh, to keep yeah. us. Form just do the latest and greatest. You know, it, uh, the, it used to be a it used to be a monotypic species, a single species called Spina non punctatus. That's the way it always was. And uh, when I was out there doing my work, that's the way it was. But right about the midway through my work, um, there was a pretty good justification to tease out a second species called Spina non guntheri, uh, named after Elder Gunther, who was a herpetologist that was the first one to really identify. These as a very unique reptile. Um, so, anyways, um, so for, for, for many years it, it kind of uh, kept at that. And it's gone back and forth to maintaining those two species. Uh, there's been some different uh, mitochondrial DNA work that definitely showed, uh, you know, more than five percent sequence divergence between the two, which at that point gives you enough justification to break them up into two different species. Um, you know, some have basically brought them back into a single species, even on punctatus under the original. Classification. So uh, both of them have been published. So which one you want to accept is kind of up to you. I mean, from from an from an evolutionary species concept, you could probably make a pretty good justification that every single island population is probably to some extent a, a different species, at least underneath the evolutionary species concept, because they're all certainly taking on uh, unique uh, trajectories in that direction. You know, they're 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 not they're not swimming from island to island, and so. Um, you know the, uh, the 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 idea that you know we have just a single species that you know occur between on the, you know on the islands of Cook, you know at least uh, Stevens Island and the Cook Strait, right between the north and the south island of New Zealand, up to the northern part of the North Island, and you know, yet these are all one single species. It's kind of you know I guess you kind of have to look at the you know the, the type of flexion pressures uh, and all, a lot of different things. But you know from from a, from a straight straight genetic perspective, you know it appears to be justification that you know there's still qualify uh, at least a group of the two different species but again that that's it, it has been debated and it still will be debated always will be debated because you know biologists are biologists and that's the way biologists work you know <laughs> we like to debate things and we like to be uh, uh, kind of uh, one up each other sometimes but in the end we all work together hopefully to try to resolve that but uh, it's it, it, you know systematic taxonomy is a it's a it's a constantly changing landscape, and so that's kind of where it's at. Yeah, I think the old saying is, the only thing taxonomists can agree on is that the other one's wrong. Yeah, sometimes that might be the case. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's really interesting, though, that they so they don't, um, popu- a population on one island won't ever mate with a population on the other island. But, I mean, but not, not, not without, I mean, again, you know, they, they, you know, I guess the interesting question becomes, you know, how do they get to the island they, they, they have to run? Yeah. I guess, yeah, you know, you have to start looking at, um, you know, in fact, I had this, I had this species of uh, lice of Maclotide, and uh, lice of Maclotide uh, has been always known as, it's always been broken up into three different subspecies. And it, we'll get, we'll, we'll relate this to Tutar here in a second, but uh, with a, the, the, the pattern by which the two target these islands. But in Indonesia, these, these, these pythons occurred on, uh, occur on at least five different islands, probably more, but at least five different known island populations. We have uh, one that, that lies, at least that, 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 that is found within the island of Savu, uh, and it's called, uh, it's called, it's a scientific name, these lice is Maclotai savuensis. We have a uh, population of these pythons on the island of Wetar that is called lice is Maclotai sunai. And then we have uh, layers, and then we also have these pythons on the islands of Roti, Simao, and Timor that are called Laces, Maclotai, and Maclotai. And so we, uh, what we were looking at is whether or not, you know, one is, uh, are these three different defined subspecies or should they be elevated to full species status? Those kind of things. Anyways, that's a whole other, 
whole other story right there. But uh, one of the things we were trying to figure out is, you know, how do these pythons get to these islands? You know, these, these the waters in that area are full of tiger sharks and predators, and the, the likelihood of a python, you know, making a very, very long, long, long trek from one island to the next is pretty much slim to none. But when you start looking at the, uh, uh, the, the genetics of, uh, of everything and, and trying to do, a, looking at what's called the phylogeography of these groups, which is just looking at the historical divergence of where these populations came from, it, it appears that um, another closely python species called uh, Lysis fuscus, the Australian water python, which we'll find on the northern part of Australia, uh, also gets into parts of New Guinea. And you start looking at different types of, of, uh, of uh, island connections, these little underwater, you know, uh, uh, kind of, uh, you know, I guess, uh, corridors, if you will, that used to be above sea level that are now below sea level, probably provide a way for at least the Australian water python, they just bust us to get to New Guinea. From there, it appears that the Indonesian uh, sea, uh, sea current, which is very kind of counter counterclockwise cyclic, goes right along these islands. And it, it, it definitely, it definitely, we still look at the, the genetics of this group, it matches up almost exactly with these different currents. That, that run around these islands. And it's very plausible that these, that these uh, pythons probably rafted uh, opportunistically you know, through different types of climatic events, you know, tsunamis, those kind of things, uh, probably rafted from one island to the next opportunistically and probably spread that way. It's very, it's plausible that that's how a two-tar got from one island to the next as well. Now, it's always, there's always that, you know, did people have anything to do with it? Sure, you know, people could have done it too. Uh, but, uh, you, know, this, you know, rafting definitely is becoming a more, more of a plausible way in which animals get from one island to the next, especially with animals that are not known to, you know, to, to, to move from island to island, um, you, know, uh, you know, at least, at least it, it, that's been documented. Now, you know, Komodo dragon, different story. They, 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 they swim from island to island all together, but you're looking at a very large lizard uh, that is able to, to do that. So, but uh, anyway. You don't see any, like, any like physiological or morphological differences between like the different populations of the different islands? If they're not, um, there's no like gene flow or anything. Uh, you do see some. No, you do. That, that, that's why they originally uh, broke up the uh, Spina punctatus into Spina non punctatus and Spina non gunteri. It's because of some very, uh, uh, very uh, obvious uh, uh, character state differences, especially in regards to uh, just uh, morphology. The morphology led to then some genetic tests that showed enough divergence that it, it led early biologists to kind of reclassify this single species of two current to two different species. So, yes, you do. That, that's why, you know, I, I think with enough um, uh, information and I think, you know, again, depending upon which species concept you want to use, you could probably make a pretty good justification that there's probably more than one species, probably more than two species of, of two Atara. Interesting. So circling back to uh, your work with Gila monsters and beaded lizards, is there a specific reason you chose to work with their venom on that? Um, a lot of it had to do with the fact that you know there was a, uh, a growing uh, a growing amount of, of literature with uh, with at least with uh, the the, the uh, uh, Gila monster venom that you know there was there was definitely some uh, uh, benefits of venom as a reply to humans. You know, the, you know ironically, the, the properties that make venom deadly are also what make it so valuable for medicine as well. And that's the uh, kind of ironic thing, that you know, many, many venom toxins, including those that are in the Gila monster saliva, uh, will target the same molecules that need to be controlled to treat diseases. So it's just, you know, it, 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 that, that, it, it, it's really the, the interest of kind of looking at, okay, what, what can we what other things can we do with the uh, uh, the venom as it relates to the medical world? You know, we have a can you know, we have an institute for cancer research at Bob Jones, and I think that there's this sort of uh, uh, this, this kind of multi-dimensional study between uh, you know, us working with the Gila monsters in the Serpentarium, and then you know the the cancer lab kind of looking at some different projects was kind of a, a, a nice little arrangement that we could work together and, and, and kind of adding to the data set uh, that's out there with. Uh, Gila monster venom as it relates to medicine, and so uh, you know a lot of the you know there's been lots of new treatments as a result of 
of, of, of finding out what are some of these peptides and proteins in kilo monster venom, uh, things that could help you know treat things such as different autoimmune diseases, certainly cancer, um, uh, certainly you know diabetes control, you know type two diabetes uh, has largely been controlled by some of the peptides that have been uh, extracted from kilo monster venom into a product called Vieta. And so there's been just a lot of uh, interesting and very, very novel, uh, you know, uh, treatments as a result of venom research. It's not just Gila monsters, any kind. I mean, but there's thousands of animals, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of animals that are producing uh, this type of venom that are going to have some sort of medical use. And I think that's one of the reasons why, you know, the, 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 the conservation of these animals becomes so important that we make sure we conserve these wild populations so that uh, if there's a medical benefit down the road that, you know, we don't lose the species before we find out what that is. Um, you know, with, um, if you look at, let's say, for example, uh, you know, there, there's a, there's a there's one, one of the peptides that we were looking at is called Helodermin. Uh, Helodermin is kind of a newly isolated peptide, you know, from the venom of Gila monsters um, and kind of has, has been shown to kind of stimulate different types of, of cellular activities. There's this, uh, uh, there's these, uh, um, there's, 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 there's activity in cells that, that are controlled by what are called signal transduction pathways. These are, it, you have to kind of target very specific proteins on the cell surface, let's say, let's say cancer cells. You're going to have to, you know, regulate that cancer cell to prevent it from dividing over and over and over, which is what, you know, contributes to the, you know, the, 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 the disease output of, of what's going on. So if you can kind of figure out, you know, how to destroy these cancer cells, at least or prevent them from dividing, then you can start controlling some of the rate of cancer development. So uh, that's one of the things that these peptides do is they seem to really target, at least with, uh, especially with some of these small cell sarcomas in the lung that can develop, uh, that these these small peptides will actually bind to these different types of receptors on these specific cancer cells, and it starts it really starts kind of wreaking havoc on these uh, the the genetically cyclic activity of these different signal transduction pathways that then start uh, causing. Um, uh, kind of uncontrolled, what we call apoptosis. Apoptosis is a, is a, is which is not, I guess another word you could say is cell suicide, but it's not just like a random cell suicide. All cells have a program point where they're going to die. Uh, and so, uh, we want those cells to die so they don't become these renegade cells, become cancer cells. And so all cells have this very programmed rate of death called apoptosis. Well, with cancer cells, they're not really regulated. So if you can, if you can figure out how to, uh, how to work outside those, that program, that program that would normally cause them to die, if you can get in there and cause them to die outside that, that control, then you've, you've, you've kind of fallen into something that can help, uh, that, uh, uh, at least get rid of the cancer. So that's, that, those are some of the things that we're trying to figure out and, and what we're kind of working on, at least in the, uh, Institute of Cancer Research here. And a uh, follow-up question to that is, are there any other Venom research projects you're planning on pursuing in the future? Um, yeah, I think uh, one, one would be essentially the um, uh, looking at, well, one, one that I was uh, really interested in is looking at uh, copperheads. And so uh, copperheads um, uh, produce some interesting um, uh, peptides. One is... Uh, it's a it's a type of it's a type of peptide. Peptides are just small little proteins, but uh, we find this in actually the contorture, you know, the, the species that we that make up the copperhead. But what it does, it, it sort of a uh, it's a very interesting peptide in that again, it, it 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 really goes after cells specifically, and what it does is it, it, it binds to some types of targeted cancer cells. It'll bind to these things called integrins. And integrins are these, these structures, these molecules found on, on the cell membrane that help cells to be able to move uh, from one point to another. Uh, in other words, like you, you've probably heard the word metastasis, you know, where if a cancer metastasizes, it spreads to other parts of the body. Well, a lot of times these cancer cells are able to do that because of these integrins. And the, 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 some of the peptides in copperhead saliva and venom um, actually really messes with those integrins and therefore really kind of, uh, uh, kind of, uh, uh, it, because of how it binds to it, it will help to limit the amount of metastasis that can happen as a result of that. So anyways, all that to say, there's, uh, there's some other things that are of interest with uh, copperhead uh, venom that uh, I would love to uh, kind of get into the, uh, 
asking if you can find a specific target receptor on a cancer cell that's sensitive, sensitive to that uh, contortion band, band, for example, and copperhead uh, venom, uh, that again, you can help control metastasis and help to keep the cancer where it's at and make them more easy, easily uh, focalized for the purpose of treatment and, and getting rid of it. So, anyway, so, can, so copperheads would be a, a, a cool one. One, we've got a ton of copperheads in South Carolina, so it'd be an easy species to, uh, to, to find and, and to work with. We can certainly collect the venom uh, quite easily. And, you know, trying to milk, milk in a copperhead is far easier and less time intensive than as milk in a Gila monster, <laughs> which is because of, of the, the venom delivery apparatus of uh, Gila monsters. Um, it, you know, you, that, that venom comes from this very spongiest, spongiest kind of uh, uh, salivary glands in the, in the bottom uh, jaw, and that, spun, that, 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 that venom just has to be kind of chewed and, and sort of exuded from the salivary gland and kind of work itself through uh, some little uh, channels in the, in the bottom of mandibular teeth, uh, and just through capillary action, it gets you know, infused, you know, basically injected into the, really chewed into the, the, the prey. So it's kind of, so to get venom out of a human monster is, is quite labor intensive. Getting, getting venom out of a copperhead is, is far simpler. Uh, and so I'm hoping we can maybe at some point uh, embark on a study with that. The uh, copperheads, they're, um, they're pit vipers, but they don't have uh, selenoglyphic fangs, correct? No, they do. You know, they're, they're selenoglyphic. Oh, they do? So they're, okay. Yeah, they have a, a hollow, hollow retractable teeth so, or fangs. So they are selenoglyphs. Okay. Um, yeah. Another thing is, uh, so you you, um, you mentioned there's there's been a handful of medications already that um, that have been derived from venom that are already in use, like ramipril and integralin. How how close are would you say they are to actually having like a a medication to treat cancer that's that's more like widely mainstream used? Obviously, there's years of testing that goes with it, like to get FDA approved and all that. But how close would you say they are to that? If, I mean. I, I think they're. I think there's. There's already. I, I think they're pretty close. I mean, I, but I, I mean that's. It's a relative term. I mean, I guess the. The whole thing with COVID, maybe it will help speed up a lot of areas of medical research because, uh, you know, if we can get a vaccine approved in, in, in a very short amount of time, that normally takes about eight to twelve years to get approved. Maybe we can uh, get some emergency uh, uh, <laughs> looks with some of the uh, therapeutic treatments with some of the venoms that are out there. So, uh, but as, as far as timetables go, it's hard to. It's hard to say. Um, Typically, I mean, it's, you're looking at, you know, uh, it, it, it can be a decade before you get something, you know, to, to the point where you're getting it uh, into some phase three clinical trials. So uh, we'll see. We'll see what happens. So it, it's definitely there's a lot of work going on, and I'm guessing we're pretty close. So. Cool. Very cool. Did you have any more questions, Nate? Uh, no, not at the moment. Cool. Well, hey, you guys got me at dinner time, so that's good. <laughs> we're, we're here to please. <laughs> no, it's nice chatting with you guys, and uh, all the best uh, you know, with the uh, podcast, and uh, look forward to seeing the, uh, at least listening to your upcoming speakers. I hear you got some really good ones lined up, and uh, should be real exciting. All right, thank you. Yeah, we really appreciate you uh, coming on and talking with us. It was actually really interesting. All right. Well, anytime, and... Uh, Maybe we can uh, chat some more and uh, maybe uh, elaborate some more on some other things going on. But uh, it's great talking to you guys. And, and for those that don't know, both these uh, both these guys were my past students and uh, uh, worked with us in our uh, serpentarium and uh, did a great job. So. You can't see him, but I'm blushing. All right, thank you. So long, folks. All right, guys. We'll see you. Take care. See you. So long, folks. Yeah, bye-bye.